Hey everyone, Nigel and Luke here, and welcome to Crime Zone. Though we've all heard the saying, money can't buy happiness, there is perhaps no better example of the cliche in action than when it comes to those that strike it rich in the lottery. While the idea of finding oneself an overnight millionaire seems like a dream come true, for many, the money proves to be too much to handle, leading them down a path of social, emotional, and most ironic of all, financial ruin. Though this is of course not always the case, it's happened enough times that many people refer to winners as being affected by a so-called lottery curse. And unfortunately, for some, the final cost of winning the lottery ends up being far darker than simply losing all the money. Today, we wanted to take a look at three cases like this, focusing on lottery winners who met tragic ends after striking it rich. Before we get to the videos, don't forget to like and subscribe to Crime Zone for more true crime content like this. It really helps us to continue building the channel. And if you've watched a few of our videos already, you might not even realize that you're not subscribed. While you're there, don't forget to hit the notification bell to stay up to date with our latest releases. With that out of the way, here is part one of three tragic crimes involving lottery winners. On Christmas Eve 1988, Michael Allen's life was changed forever. Though the 25-year-old did not normally gamble, he had purchased a ticket in the Tri-State Megabucks draw that night because the jackpot was so high. Incredibly, his numbers had come up. He had won $5.8 million. The incredible sum was more money than Michael could have ever imagined. He had grown up poor in the city of Lewiston, Maine, the son of a mother who had been married six times and a father that he had never known. With few opportunities after high school, Michael had joined the army where he worked as a cook. In the three years after his discharge in 1985, he had bounced around between cooking jobs before finally becoming a cab driver. Always weary of the crime in the area, he was more than happy to be able to quit his job once he had struck it rich. On the night of his big win, he excitedly walked across the living room of his mother's house and told his boyfriend, Alan Crocker, that they would never have to work again. When Michael's first annual payment came through, he was immediately generous with his winnings, donating to charity and spending lavishly on those close to him. According to friends, he became the kind of person who was known for bringing extra gifts to places on Christmas in case there was someone he didn't know there. Michael was also more than happy to help out friends with things like food and clothes. There were plenty of people in need, especially in the poverty-stricken parts of Lewiston where he grew up. Despite Michael's apparent generosity, it didn't take long for his newfound wealth to alienate him from his friends and family. According to his mother and siblings, he always had a penchant for risk-taking, but the money made it possible for him to jump headlong into things like he had never done before. In addition to buying cars, boats, and other expensive items, Michael soon began a spree of real estate investment, purchasing several apartment buildings, a cafe, a diner, and two nightclubs, which he named The Alternative and Mike's Place. However, with the exception of his apartment buildings, it seemed that Michael rarely stuck with any of his investments for the long run. Within a couple of years of operation, all of his businesses closed down, as he quickly moved on to his next big idea. Emblematic of this trend were his two nightclubs, which he told friends that he had closed down simply because he was bored of running them. Worried that Michael's reckless spending would endanger the things that he had purchased for them, some of his friends and family took legal action against him. His boyfriend, Alan Crocker, filed a lawsuit and ended up settling for an annual payment of $30,000 for 13 years while Michael's mother hired a team of lawyers to make sure that he would be forced to make the mortgage payments on the home that he had bought for her. Michael's family weren't the only ones who noticed the wild spending, though. Many in the city's gay community would later say that he often flaunted his cash at local establishments and seemed to be trying to buy popularity to offset his insecurity. The reputation reportedly earned him the nickname Megabucks Mike, by 1995, Michael's fast cash lifestyle forced him to declare bankruptcy. He was not actually broke, 
but had to file in order to get an advance on his lottery payments so he could keep up his spending. The advance came at the expense of a sizable portion of his future payments. Though Michael had temporarily avoided disaster, it seemed like he was headed down a very predictable road faced by many lottery winners, and might actually go broke if he wasn't careful. However, just two years later, his story would end in a different kind of tragedy that no one could have predicted. On April 28, 1997, Michael received a call from two men asking him to meet them at the Holiday Motel in Lewiston. The men were cousins 24-year-old Brad Chesnell and 27-year-old Leroy Toma Jr., and they had recently been evicted from one of Michael's apartments in Lewiston's sister city of Auburn. The exact nature of what the men told Michael they wanted from him that day remains unknown, but it has been theorized that he agreed to go because he had previously had an intimate relationship with one of the men. Chesnell and Toma may have also told Michael that they wanted to discuss their recent eviction. What we do know is that shortly after Michael arrived at the motel, he was savagely beaten to death with a blunt instrument in one of the rooms. His body was discovered the following day still inside the room by one of the building's cleaning workers. His emerald green GMC pickup truck was later found abandoned in the town of Old Orchard Beach, roughly an hour's drive south of Lewiston. It didn't take long for authorities to turn their suspicions toward Chesnell and Toma. Michael's mother had known about their meetup on the day of the murder, and the owner of the Holiday Motel remembered Toma renting the room that afternoon. Chillingly, he told police that the man had asked for a room where he could have peace and quiet, and said, quote, I'm going to get some sleep tonight. Warrants were issued for Chesnell and Toma's arrests, and a nationwide alert was put out for them. They were captured roughly a week later all the way across the country at a YMCA in Palo Alto, California, having traveled there by bus. Investigators quickly determined that the motive behind the crime was robbery, as cash and valuables worth in excess of $10,000 were found to be missing from Michael's person when his body was discovered. This included his wallet, credit cards, checkbook, and two diamond rings. After being returned to Maine, Chesnell and Toma were both charged with murder, robbery, and theft. When the men were tried together in February of 1998, they both told different stories about what had happened on the day of Michael's murder, with each pointing the finger at the other. Toma claimed that Chesnell had flown into a rage after Michael had made an advance towards him and beat him with a two-foot hammer. Chesnell, meanwhile, claimed that he had briefly left the room after Michael arrived, only to come back and discovered Toma beating Michael with a crowbar. Though a judge did not allow this information to be shared at trial, it's worth noting here that at the time the pair were arrested, Chesnell was already awaiting sentencing for beating a man with a hammer in 1996, and there had also been an assault complaint filed against him by his girlfriend just 10 days before Michael's death. On February 24, 1998, after just three hours of deliberation, a jury found both Chesnell and Toma guilty of murdering and robbing Michael Allen. Toma received a sentence of 47 years, while Chesnell received life in prison. Both men appealed their convictions, and the cases made it to the state Supreme Court. However, both convictions were upheld just weeks apart from one another in the summer of 1999. An article in the Boston Globe in May of 1997 perhaps best summed up Michael's tragic story noting that his legacy would at once be of a man who struggled to manage his wealth in a community burdened by poverty, but who at the same time had an almost childlike fascination with each passing day and its possibilities. Do you know of any other cases like this that you think we should check out? Tell us about them in the comments section below. As always, if you enjoyed our video, don't forget to like and subscribe to Crime Zone for more true crime content like this making sure to hit the notification bell to stay up to date with our latest releases. Thank you for watching.